I tell students when I speak to them, don't be Hal Plo, okay? Don't be Mr. Hal Plo. Hal Plo was a gentleman that worked at IBM with me. And he once told a story of this very aggressive, uh, newly hired IBMer that had been in the Naval Academy. Well, this man was so aggressive, by March of a given year, he had sold all the computers IBM had, and he had no more to sell. So he would go to the IBM executives and say, my customers need this, my customers need this. And IBM, at that time, moved, it was the largest company in America, the most profitable company in America, and it was moving very slow. Uh, companies back then, up in the 80s and 90s, didn't move as fast as companies do today. So this young salesman, he had nothing to do. So what he did, he kept talking, talk, talking with his customers, trying to find out what their needs were. But IBM, the, the company he worked for, was too slow to move. So what he did, he went to the top seven salesmen in IBM in Dallas, Texas. He went to the top seven. He said, hey, I got all these ideas. I got these customers lined up. Let's leave IBM. Six of the seven left. You know who that young man was? It was H. Ross Perot. The one that stayed was Hal Plo. That's why I tell people, don't be Hal Plo. Everybody else are multi, multi-millionaires, and Hal Plo simply retired with a pension. People that are successful in today's market, they break the norm. They set their own new rules. Jay-Z in his new Magna Carta album says, I crashed through glass ceilings, I kicked down wooden doors. You can't do the norm if you're going to be successful in today's market. You have, to, you have to do something meaningfully different. A lady once said, if it's me against 48, I feel sorry for the 48. That lady was Margaret Thatcher. Doing things meaningfully different. Some people are destined for success. Some people are determined for success. As Joan of Arc led thousands of men into battle, a 14-year-old virgin leading thousands of men into battle, this is what she told them. I was born for this. It's a proven fact that 80% of your results come from only 20% of your effort. It's just like studying, playing basketball, playing football. 80% of your results come from 20% of your, your efforts. But to be meaningfully different in today's market and to be meaningfully successful, 99% of your results come from 1% of your effort. 1%. Success is a statistical event. People often, often say practice makes perfect. That is so wrong. That is so dead wrong. Perfect practice makes perfect. Okay? Perfect practice. Success is a statistical event. Okay? It's a, the more hours you study for algebra tests, the better you're going to do. The more times you hit a golf ball, the better you're going to swing. The more times you hit a baseball, the, the, the better your swing is. But, again, success is a statistical event. At 10,000 hours of practice, psychologists, sociologists say you're an expert in any given field. 10,000 hours. But one thing um, successful people have found out, talent is overrated, okay? Talent is very, very much overrated, okay? People only reach 10% of their, their given potential. Isn't that kind of scary? You're bright, you got a 3.7, and you're only achieving 10% of your given potential. What if you dug deeper? 90% of people that any given task or any div given quest 90% of them fail. They don't fail. You know what happens? They quit. They quit. They give up. MLK, Martin Luther King, had to be one of the baddest brothers that ever lived. Okay? Martin Luther King did the same thing every day of his adult life. Again, practices a statistical event. He woke up at 6.05. He ate the same meal, a cup of black coffee and a glass of orange juice. And for the next 45 minutes of his adult life, he meditated and prayed. He meditated and prayed for the next 45 minutes and visualized what he wanted to do. The Montgomery boycott was supposed to last one day. 
when Rosa Parks wouldn't get up off the bus, was supposed to last one simple day. It lasted for over a year. Martin Luther King realized to say, we got something to leverage here. You know, Martin Luther King was 27 years old when he, when he organized the boycott, 27 years old. Martin Luther King only owned six suits in his life, three black, two gray. And when he won the, the Nobel Prize, he gave the major, after he paid a few taxes, he gave the majority of the quarter million dollars back to the movement. Bill, William F. Gates, makes $67,000 a second. He, he, every few minutes, he alternates between him and Larry Ellison and Warren Buffett as the, most, the richest man out in America. Makes $67,000 a second. Bill Gates, freshman year at Harvard, him and his best friend, um, Paul Allen, go into the bookstore. They see an advertisement for a, a contest. They'll give somebody $5,000 that can make two computer uh, systems talk. Back in the early 80s, when I worked for IBM, everybody had a different operating system. No two computer systems talked. So what did Bill Gates do? Bill Gates and Paul Allen dropped out of Harvard, went to the desert of New Mexico, and for seven years they tried. For seven years they failed. Then one day, they said, we think we got it. What did Bill Gates do? Bill Gates picked up the phone and called the president of Encyclopedia Britannica. And he explained to him his operating system and how this system would revolutionize the world. What did the president of Encyclopedia Britannica do? He hung up in Bill Gates' face. Okay, successful people, persistent, courage, faith. What did Bill Gates do? Bill Gates picked up the phone. He called the president of Encarta, okay? You look at any operating system, you'll see the software package on there, Encarta. Where is Encyclopedia Britannica today? Out of business. Encarta on every uh, Microsoft operating system. Tiger. Tiger, Eldrick Tiger Woods, the most phenomenal golfer in American history. Tiger Woods, at, in the third grade, you know I talk about practice, makes perfect practice makes perfect, practice a success is a statistical event. Tiger Woods, in the third grade, gets up at 5.30 in the morning, goes to a nearby golf course, and plays nine holes of golf before class. Goes to class, finishes his classroom duties, comes back to the golf course and finishes the other nine holes in the third grade. What were you doing in the third grade? Okay. Tiger Woods had just won a major U.S. tournament. He, fly, he gets in his private jet, success, flies back to his, his uh, palatial mansion in Florida, and he starts watching today's that previous day's tapes as he signs autographs, talks to his agent, talks to, talk to his travel agent, talks to his family, but he has a tape running, and he's barely watching it. Four hours into the tape, he notices, about two or three in the morning, he notices a flaw in his swing. You know what Tiger Wood does? He calls his, his coach, 2.33 in the morning, he calls his coach and says, get over here. I notice a flaw in my swing. I need to practice. And that's a man that makes $62 million a year in a, in a year when he doesn't even win a tournament. One more person. Lil Wayne. I like Lil Wayne. Okay? Cash money records. What can you guys tell me about cash money records? Really nothing. It is the most successful record company in American music history. Did you guys know that? Let me tell you why. It's, they haven't sold the most records, but let me tell you what happened. Back, in, when, right before that major record deal, the two owners of Cash Money Records, the Williams brothers, Slim and Baby, they fly to New York to interview with Def Jam's owners, Russell Cohen and uh, um, Lyra Cohen and Russell Simmons. So these two guys walk in, mouth full of gold, pants sagging like a lot, a lot of y'all probably do, and they tell the owners of Def, Def Jam, we will let you do this with our records and do this with our records. And, and the owners of Def Jam say, whoa, whoa, that's not how the record industry works. We'll give you 3%, maybe 4 And these guys say, ain't no way. Um, they said, no, we own our records. They're already making a million dollars a week out of the trunk of their car. So what they do, they fly back to New Orleans. Now they're making $2 million a week out of the trunk of their cars. The, the records are so hot, a risk of Sony, they said, we've got to get a part of this. The reason I said they're the most successful record company in the history of American music history is this reason. They're able to keep 80 
percent of their profits. Why Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, Rolling Stones, Beatles, Celine Dion, you name them, they keep three or four percent. Meaningfully different. You have to do something meaningfully different. And that's why, because they didn't know, they broke the mold, they didn't fit the norm. You have to do something meaningfully different to be successful in today's market. A lot of times you have to think less and do more. If you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be successful, you have to move, you have to act, you have to put things in motion as opposed to thinking. Thinking is the, is the enemy of doing. Do something, anything. Even if it's, you make a mistake, you learn from your mistakes. When you make a mistake, you embrace it. You learn from it. And you, you know what you do? You move on to the next mistake. I have made many, many mistakes in this business. We have $14 million or $17 million of contracts in place. And I make mistakes every single day. But one thing I try to do, I try to learn from my mistakes. I embrace them, and I'm ready to move on to the next one. Okay? Who in this audience wants to be a millionaire? Some of you don't. Okay. Do you want to file bankruptcy two times? Do you want to be divorced one and a half times? Do you want your business ventures to fail 16 times before you have one to work? Okay? Is that what you want? Okay? In my quest to be a business owner, I didn't lose one BMW. I lost two. I lost my house. I lost my wife. I lost my first child. But I was dedicated to the task of building this business. There's this thing when you're working in your area of expertise, they call flow, okay? When you're working in flow, time doesn't matter, pressure doesn't matter, nothing else matters. You, Oprah Winfrey descri described it as breathing. It's like you're breathing. You're doing something so effortlessly other people cannot do. One of the things successful people, you, you, all of us have heard the secrets of success, the secrets of millionaires, the secrets, there are no secrets. <laughs> it, 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 it drives me crazy when I hear there are secrets. There's no secrets of success. Success and the models of success have been studied since the turn of the century. In 1900, the year 1900, there were 5,000 millionaires. In the year 2010, there were 50,000 millionaires, and why? I can tell you what, right today, sitting in this office, there's one or two of you will be millionaires. One or two of you. I don't know which ones, okay? I can't tell you, but I can tell you there's one or two will be sitting there, because you'll have to have the drive, the commitment, the courage, and the faith to believe in yourself when others don't. I can't tell you how many times I got laughed at, okay? I can't tell you how many times I got ridiculed, okay? but I kept believing in myself. I was told one, about 10 years ago that I would have a million dollar company. The person that told me that, I thought they were crazy. But I believed in myself. I'll tell you about my two heroes. One of my heroes, 10th grade education. My other hero, Harvard graduate. One, the other hero, 10th grade education, from the South, okay? Very learned man. My other hero, uh, he's the only African American that has a building named at him at Harvard, Reginald F. Lewis, okay? He's the only African-American, again, that has a building named after him at the Harvard campus. Reginald Lewis was an African-American man from Baltimore, Maryland. He came to Harvard for one, you know when I talk about have a plan, an ability to execute? Reginald Lewis came to Harvard for one reason and one reason only, to study, study under Louis, uh, Lewis Loss. Lewis Loss was an expert on leverage buyouts, okay? He was an expert. So what, what Reginald Lewis did, he came to Harvard. He studied under Lewis Loss. He was, the he was basically the first African-American billionaire before the Oprah's and before all the other people you hear about. He, was a, he died at 50 years old. And he set, a, he set a precedent for excellence in business in the African-American community, okay? You have to have a plan, show up, execute, 